The Lord be with you. First of all, can we welcome back Bruce? Bruce, yeah! Recently a father the second time around. Congratulations. Yeah, very exciting. Um, hey, quick announcement. Tomorrow night at 7.30 in Graves, we'll be starting a month-long conversation every Tuesday that we have classes throughout the month of February looking at the important topics of love, sex, and dating. We think it's important to have a collective conversation to look at these issues. So come on out, 7.30, Graves Hall. We'd love to see you there. This morning, I'd like to introduce to you Father David McConey. Come on out. He is a professor of theology from St. Louis University and will be bringing the word to us this morning. Also, today, there's a slide. Yes, today at 4 o'clock in Martha Miller Room 135, he will be giving a presentation on self-loathing and Augustine. We invite you to come out and hear. So, Thank you. I, and actually, this is, he is a Hope alumni as well, so he's coming home. Yeah. When I was here, I went to one of those love, sex, and dating things. You see how good it did me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's awesome. Um, do, you mind if, do you mind if I pray? Pray. <laughs> All right. Wow. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is in your light that we see all light. So we pray this morning that you would come in your revealing light and reveal to us more of who you are and the world you have created us to be a part of. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Chapel has changed. Music has gotten better, and as you're about to see, the preaching has gotten worse. <laughs> Forty days this morning... Ago, where were you? You were opening Christmas presents. Today in the Catholic tradition is the Feast of the Presentation in which a young Jewish mother would have brought in her child to the temple and presented him. In my prayer this morning, I was thinking of coming to this place, to this temple, to this chapel. And on this day, we would bless the candles. And tomorrow, in the Catholic tradition, we would bless throats. It's a weird thing. I don't get it, but that's what we do. But the light is coming into the world, and the days are getting longer, and we remember the fact that Christ himself undergoes what we do every morning, come to chapel to pray to the Father. I want to read to you not that story of Luke with Simeon and Anna, although I would encourage you to read that sometime in your prayer today, but I want to go back to the Gospel of Mark. Because driving here last night, I haven't been on campus. I graduated here in 87. You weren't even born yet, were you? That's right. He was the smart one. Listen to this Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, his home, after some days, it became known that he was at home. Many gathered there so that there was no longer room for them, not even around the door. And so he preached the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Unable to get near Jesus because of the crowd, they opened up the roof above him. And after they'd broken through, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there asking themselves, Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who but God alone can forgive sins? Jesus said to them, why are you thinking such things in your hearts? What is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise, pick up your mat and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, he then said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. He rose, picked up his mat, and all who saw him at once gave glory to God. Two questions for you, my friends. Who are the four people who have lowered you to Jesus? Let's take a second in our prayer this morning and just ask ourselves, who are the people who have most intimately lowered me to the face of Christ? Who are the ones who have interceded 
and have been my Christian examples and my models. In our Christian tradition, pride is the worst sin. Pride comes before the fall because pride is ultimately the dismissal of any dependency on one another. And when I was here 30 years ago, I was full of pride. I was full of what I thought was self-sufficiency. I was full of a lot of dumb ideas. Getting older, you realize that all of us are products of relationships, that we are here because someone loves us. We are here because someone has brought us to Christ. And so we should never let a day go by without thinking and thanking God for those people. The second question is, don't you think it's a little mean of Jesus to ask this man who's been on this this paralytic's mat for years to take it now and go? The last thing this guy wants to see is this mat anymore. But it's the one thing that allows the people in the community to recognize the power of God at work. Of course this man wants to shun that which has kept him as an outcast of society. Of course he wants to just get rid of that which kept him away from living a normal life. But Jesus oftentimes asks us to do something else. Oftentimes he says, look, I'm inviting you to hold on to your imperfections and weakness for now so that you may know the glory and the power of God working through you. And I was thinking about addressing a room full of promising, obviously highly functioning young people The world will only love you where you're strong and successful. You think you're only lovable where your GPA and your sports career matter and where there's something to tell others about and put on our home pages. But the love of Christ works the exact opposite way. Christ is drawn to you not because of your perfections. The Father sends the Son into our human condition because of our imperfections. That in fact, Jesus loves you precisely in those places you don't love yourself. Jesus loves you all the more in those places where you feel unlovable. Because when we read the scriptures rightly, we start to see that our God works his greatest power precisely in the places the world can't imagine God could ever be. In prisons, in tombs, on the cross. And so my message to you this morning as we celebrate the Feast of the Presentation, that God is given to us not in the places where we feel successful and strong, but precisely in the places where we're weak. Because with all the world, we'll tell everyone the success stories of our lives. Don't we do that every morning? How many times do you pass someone on campus this morning and say, hey, how you doing? What do they say? Good. You know the one person says, oh, let me tell you how I'm doing. I'm like, ah, shoot, I got class, you know. But intimacy is born precisely where we share the weaknesses and the struggles. That true community is shared with only a select few, and that's precisely where the love of God occurs. Not in the places that we think the world accepts us, but precisely in those places where we stumble and fall are in need of grace. And that's what that paralytics mat represents this morning. But oftentimes Christ says, no, look, I know you want to be somebody else, but I need you to be this person now. And I need you to be able to be vulnerable and humble enough to tell people that I am at work in your life and I have been healing you. And I thank the Lord for beginning to heal me in my Christian way, beginning on this campus in so many ways. You have a great thing here. Please know that you glorify God in your studies, in your friendships, and in all the little ways that make up your day. So thank you and may Almighty God bless you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. It's 10.50, that's what I was told to do.